When people have free time, some people like to go for long walks on the beach. Others like to read books. Others like to do sports. And others, yes, others build their own Kubernetes clusters on bare metal at home. In our next episode, you'll be hearing from Matthias, who did it all on his own, from start to finish. We hear about the technologies he used along the way, whether or not he used Argo or Flux, what he decided to use when it came to networking, and lots of other details that I'm sure you'll find interesting. Check it out. All right, Matthias, you've got a brand new Kubernetes cluster. Which three tools are you going to install on it first? I think I'm uh, pretty basic in that regard. Uh, Ingress controller, um, cert manager, and uh, external DNS. I think I'm right choices. Yeah, it's interesting. Our, our previous guest that we had also mentioned cert manager. Why that? Um, I mean, I use it primarily for uh, securing uh, endpoints, ingress uh, ingress points. Um, so getting the HTTPS on uh, on your web services is uh, what I use it primarily for. Tell me a little bit more about what you do, who you are, and where you work. Yeah, uh, so I'm a freelance uh, DevOps engineer um, situated in Copenhagen. Uh, so I work primarily with Kubernetes, uh, DevOps, uh, and also a little bit of AWS. Uh, and then I'm also really fond of Hetzner, but uh, not so much professional work there yet. All right. Also, just typical dumb American question, Copenhagen or Copenhagen? Uh, I think I go with Copenhagen. Heard it straight from the source. Now that's resolved. <laughs> good, good, good. Now... Tell me a little bit more about your background. How did you get started with Cloud Native? What were you doing before you started working with Cloud Native Technologies? Yeah, so uh, I'm a self-taught programmer. Uh, I started uh, with HTML and CSS and did some auto-ed for some bots for video games and stuff like that. Moved into C++. Then I finally got a job working as a c .NET developer. Um, but I was embedded in the infrastructure team. So... You know, the infrastructure side of it kind of started rubbing off on me. Uh, got an interest in, you know, virtualization, networking, and all that stuff. And uh, finally decided to to see if I could jump into a, a more infrastructure-oriented role and ended up in a DevOps operations team, which is where my, my cloud-native experience kind of started, you know, working with AWS and uh, a little bit of Kubernetes. I uh, also started playing around Docker and stuff like that. Very good. You mentioned bots for video games. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Uh, so it was a it was a, um, like a Danish version of Habbo Hotel, kind of, where you had to like stay active to get credits. So I wrote a small bot in AutoIt to move around, so you didn't get uh, logged out. Uh, I think that was like my first like wow experience with program. I was like, okay, I can actually make something that has some use, and you know, I can interact with the computer in a whole different way. I think it's really important though, right? In in a developer's journey, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but you know, the the fact of one thing to be coding in your job, but then also to be taking that into, you know, personal projects so that you can build something and, and like you said, have that sort of wow experience. Um, yes. Now you learn Kubernetes, just kind of jumping in. What was the process of learning? What, what were things that maybe were challenging for you along along that process? When I started using Kubernetes, uh, it was a little bit simpler landscape back then, I think. There weren't as many options, like uh, K3S was a thing, but like K0S and some of the more, uh, like Talos, for example, didn't exist. Um, so it was a lot more difficult to deal with. Uh, I think a lot of people back then ran into the certificate expiration issues, uh, where all of a sudden the cluster stopped working after about nine months for some reason, uh, stuff like that. With that in mind, if you could go back to tell your previous self, and maybe just remind me, you know, when did you start working with Kubernetes? So let's go back a few years. At that point, what advice would you give to your previous self to make it maybe a little bit less difficult in in terms of learning how to use Kubernetes? Oh, that's a difficult one. Um, I mean, I think the best way to learn Kubernetes is to learn by doing. So just jumping into it. Uh, I mean, that's also kind of how I got started. Uh, but I think just getting into it and getting your hands dirty is the absolute best way to get started with it. Makes sense, right? Just kind of yeah. gotta, what we say in Spanish is throw yourself into the swimming pool. Hog. Yeah. Uh, and, and start swimming and, and get in, get in, get into contact with it and, you know, like developing those projects on your own as well too. I think it's a, it's a good way in, in terms of what we want to focus on today, you wrote, um, an article about bare metal Kubernetes, particularly, uh, focusing about on, uh, Talos on, on Hetzner. Mm -hmm. So 
you once again this this focuses interest in not just you know coding at work but also you know taking it um into personal projects and these can also help people eventually get jobs because it gives different kinds of visibility what are your thoughts on this is this something every programmer should think about doing uh programming in your own time or uh yeah yeah developing personal projects things of that nature i think it's a it's a very fine line uh I I think there's a, a lot of burnout, especially in uh, in the development world as well. So I think you have to be careful. Um, but I think as long as your your side project and stuff are something you're really interested in, and it's not something that you're like burning yourself out over, I think it's a it's a great way to to expand your horizon a little bit. I mean, a lot of the technologies I work with are just stuff that I've heard about or think is interesting. Um, not necessarily something I want to monetize or anything like that. But it's definitely made me a better both programmer and developer to just have like a, a even just like a, a shallow understanding of uh, networking, storage, uh, how all these things work together. That's a good point. You don't necessarily have to become an expert, but at least becoming, you know, being in contact with it and being able to empathize with the folks that are spending their, you know, day to day working with those technologies. Yeah. And, and a further thing that you mentioned too, the topic of burnout, something that comes up. Lot, right? And how to detect it when it's happening, how to stop it before it starts. In general, something that I learned probably too late because of dealing with burn on my own is, you know, estimation. So the idea of like, oh, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to create this bot for a video game or I'm going to spin up a website or I'm going to, you know, do something that in my free time is that estimations in general, I think are off by at least 50% um, from reading, from hearing from Cal Newport, who's an expert, you know, on on deep work and, and and focus time and things of that nature. In general, if you think something's going to take one hour, it'll probably take two. If you think it's gonna take one day, two, one week, two, et cetera. So keeping that in mind when doing stuff and being kind to yourself and, and trying to be as realistic as possible, I think is an important thing to keep in mind so that things that are being done for fun stay fun and don't become a burden and yeah. something that uh, you know builds up resentment. But getting back to the, the article that you wrote, you know, bare metal Kubernetes, there are a lot of different managed offerings, you know, when we talk about EKS, GKE, AKS, et cetera. Why yeah. do it on your own? What, what was the attraction about like, hey, I'm just going to jump right in and do this on my own? Uh, I mean, the primary one is definitely cost. Uh, it's a little bit expensive to run an EKS cluster 24-7 when you don't really have anything running on it. Uh, like I using, I'm using my cluster right now for running a, like a TeamSpeak server for some friends and some game service whenever we want that. Um, but it's like it's it's basically a big money sink. Uh, so that's one of the primary ones. Um, apart from that, I'm also kind of interested in you know privacy and also. I mean, one of the motivations for this cluster is trying to make a self-contained cluster. Uh, so that means like no external load balancers and stuff like that. Um, so that's also a big interest for me, and being able to eventually maybe move it onto actual hardware instead of hosting it with ads. There. If we if we shift it over to the to the side of provisioning. Doing this on, you know, a production grade Kubernetes cluster isn't something many would say that, you know, for for beginners or for the faint of heart. And there are lots of different, you know, details that have to be kept in mind uh, in order to be able to deploy your first app. How did you divide up the work so that it didn't become so overwhelming and, as you said previously, run into a feeling of burnout? Yeah, I mean, it was difficult. Uh, I have done, I've worked with a lot of the technologies before, and I've also rebuilt this cluster a number of times before. So I had a lot of, you know, background knowledge and ideas. So I was able to, you know, lay it out somewhat. But I mean, one of the big, biggest problems was uh, figuring out the dependencies. So for example, you need to have, well, Flux for one to get, you know, to configure things and have a have a really good overview of what you've actually deployed. Uh, but something like, persistent storage is really important for a lot of applications, like for example, Harbor, um, but that also has some dependencies. So trying to like figure out which things depend on which, and then trying to lay it out in that order is the difficult part. And it is also something that I that I failed at uh, because of the, um, the first incident, which is also part of the blog series, where basically the whole cluster stops working because Harbor is trying to reach the persistent storage. But the persistent storage failed because I was rebooting nodes and the nodes can't get booted because they can't reach Harbor to get the images they need. So the whole thing just kind of uh, falls apart. Uh, so that's the hard one of the hard parts. One of the hard parts for sure. And with that in mind, what should come first? You know, if people, if you got to start with one thing, what's your recommendation? First go with this, then that, then what comes next? Yeah. 
I think uh, I think uh, Flux or any kind of a, a CD product is is a good place to start, um, mainly because I believe that you know discipline is great, developer discipline, but it's also like one of the most unreliable ways of actually keeping track of what you're doing and making sure that you know you have some sense of what's going on. So deploying Flux as one of the first things, and then making sure that pretty much everything I did was through this Git repository was one of the ways to make sure that I actually had like a, a clean cluster and I had a, a, a really good idea and history of what I was actually doing with it. Because in the past, you know, you were trying to experiment for something and you worked really hard in for a week and a half, and then you lose interest or something comes up and you forget all about it. And the next time you need your cluster, you try and install something and it just doesn't work because you were halfway through replacing the CNI or uh, mucking about with something else. And speaking of mucking about with something else, I just want to <laughs> ask, you know, no, but it's true with so many different steps in, in the different, you know, technological choices you're making, how do you go about it? You say, okay, standard practice, I'm going to try Flux. I'm also going to try two or three alternatives. What's your process in terms of reaching the decision about which one is going to work best for you? Yeah. So uh, having rebuilt this cluster up a number of times, I've played with a lot of the, both the technologies that I'm using, but also some of the competitors like Argo CD, for example. Uh, so a lot of it is just, the prior experience, you know, trying it out. What are the pain points? Which ones can I live with? Which ones can't I? And then uh, just investigating the the alternatives. You you did settle on Talos eventually, you know, as one of the choices that you made. Yeah. Can you tell us really quickly what what is Talos and why did you decide to go for it? What what were the the pain points that you were really to deal with and accept that you didn't really find another competitor? Yeah. Uh, so Talos is basically an, a, a fully what do you call it, full self-contained Kubernetes operating system, kind of like uh, Flatcar Linux, which is something I've also investigated earlier but haven't had a chance to, to work with. Um, so I really like the idea of having this, the, the whole thing is basically, the whole machine is managed through a single uh, YAML document. Uh, and you can say what you want about YAML, but it's nice to have like, you, you know everything about the cluster or about the single machine from this one document. Um, and I think that's a great way to get a, a feeling for the whole setup without having to like dive into, oh, how is this thing configured? I mean, like I say in the, in the blog series, they take a lot of, make a lot of decisions for you, but as long as you're okay with these decisions, then I think it's a great choice. And in terms of any downsides, major downsides that, that our listeners should keep in mind, if they were to decide to use Talos, what are some things that, that perhaps, you know, there are always going to be trade-offs. What are yeah. what are things that you think would be important to uh, to think about there? Um, I mean, I ran into a very real one. I was trying to I was experimenting with a, a new part of the series, and I wanted to see if I could set up some uh, virtual machine hosting using Kubert. Um, but getting networking working with Kubert kind of required something called KubeOVN or a similar product, which uses OpenSwitch to do the routing between the the virtual machines, but. Trying to deploy Cube OVN was actually really difficult because it wasn't really designed for this immutable storage um, uh, solution that the Talos works with. Um, so that was something I had to actually walk back and uh, just drop that project at least for now. You mentioned, you know, that one of the one of the things that came up earlier was you know storage, and it's something that having spent a lot of time talking to people in the database space and the storage space, we know it's something that's tricky and can involve a lot of complexities. Something that also involves a fair amount of complexity would be networking. And you've settled on Cilium as your CNI of choice. Yes. What led you to that decision? I mean, I've used a lot of other ones in the, the past, like um, Flannel and stuff like that. Um, I think the performance claims, I haven't actually benchmarked any of this, but I mean, the performance claims and the using eBPF makes a lot of sense to me uh, for, for faster routing. Um, uh, I also didn't need anything like super advanced. So Celium also works well there. Uh, and then I also have a a really good use case for it with the Celium cluster-wide network policies for securing the nodes since I didn't have one of those things that you would have if you go with a provider like Azure or AWS where you have the firewall in front or the load balancer. Um, not having that meant that I had to find another way to secure my nodes. And uh, the Celium cluster-wide network policies was great for that. And in, in terms of, you know, it, you, you mentioned the, the fact of, of you know, the, the uh, about a firewall. And it's also interesting, too, because of having spoken to, a, yeah, I mean, been at CiliumCon in Amsterdam and and hearing about other folks in, in that are end users of Cilium. 
a lot of it seems to be that there's a f- initial understanding of Cilium being very much focused on networking. But then another part of it, as you rightfully mentioned, is you know the part about security, you know, and securing the nodes. Did you use a regular firewall to do so? And and on top of that, could you go into a little bit more detail about Cilium network policies and policy audit mode? Yeah. Uh, so I've locked myself out of clusters at least a couple of times in the past and the servers, you know, configuring the firewall, you accidentally cut off your own SSH access and then you just kind of lost. Um, so that was one of those things I was trying to avoid uh, this time around. So basically what I'm doing is I'm using the the Hetzner firewall for securing the Talos and the Kubernetes endpoints, uh, which is just hard-coded to whitelist only my IP, basically. Uh, and then I'm using the, the cluster policy for everything else. Um, policy audit mode is really useful for debugging these things, but at least for the nodes, which are servers that are exposed to the internet, there is a lot of traffic. So if you're enabling the the audit mode so you can go through and check that everything makes sense, uh, there's a lot of data there. So making sure that you don't do something wrong uh, is, uh, is a little difficult. Also, the way Celium handles these uh, firewall policies is by at least by default, is that it, they don't, don't enforce any rules unless there are rules. So it's basically allow all, except, except if you have policies enabled. Um, so I've also previously used these uh, net cluster-wide network policies, um, but applied them in the wrong order, which also locked me out of the cluster, which is why I'm using just a single policy this time around. Um, so at this point now, you've got a bare bone cluster that could accept deployments. What was your next move? Well, I mean, the ingress and the external DNS and the uh, the server manager is a is a great uh, great place to start because uh, then you can start getting access to web UIs and stuff like that. And well, I know we touched on it previously, but I want to dig into this a little bit more because we love a little bit of controversy. Looking at you know Flux CD versus Argo CD. Uh, yeah. In in terms of the Argo CD fans out there, if they're saying, "Hey, why did you make that choice? What what do you what do you tell you?" I imagine you probably got some feedback around that, but but I'm just curious how do, how are those conversations going? Um, yeah, I actually haven't had many people comment on that, uh, but it was a very deliberate choice. Um, I am a big fan of Argo CD, and I think as far as like discoverability and interface, I think it's a lot better than Flux CD. Um, the only real gripe I had with it was that the way it handled Helm releases, basically, where you had to sub-chart uh, a Helm chart in order to deploy it from a Git repository, which was a little roundabout way, and I wasn't exactly sure how I was managing to keep up with the versioning. So if you're sub-charting another chart, is Argo CD capable of properly noticing that an upgrade is ready for that sub-chart? Um, I'm pretty sure that since then they've actually implemented uh, a solution for this, so you can, where you call it, then um, you have the value stored alongside your, your your repository. Uh, but uh, they didn't have it back then. With having Flux set up, you go ahead and configure the rest of the cluster. Is that correct? Yeah. So with uh, with Flux CD and uh, the ingress controller and external DNS and um, we call it the the search manager all running. Uh, I decided to actually scale out the cluster because until this point, it's just been one server, which is usually pretty painless because there's no coordination, there's no uh, quorum or anything like that. Uh, so the next step was to basically scale the cluster to all three nodes. All right. I think everyone would be in agreement that this sounds like a fair amount of work. Some would even say a lot of work. Exactly how much time did this take from from the, the start up till this point? Probably around maybe a hundred hours all in all, I think. Uh, I mean, editing and writing the blog post also added a lot of, you know, time to the to the project, but it's also an incredibly worthwhile uh, experience because uh, you have a much, it forces you to go through your decisions and actually document them. And whenever you have to make a decision, you have to challenge yourself to be like, why exactly am I just defaulting to this? Like, what is the reasoning frame for me choosing this? Uh, and if you don't have an answer, you can't really write about it. Uh, so it was a very rewarding experience. I see it as an exercise because writing, taking it one step further, having to defend those you know, viewpoints because of the fact that there are alternatives out there. And you say, well, I tried this one, I tried that one, and this is what informed my decision. Yeah. As opposed to ha- perhaps being in being in a team where decisions are, making outside, where are made outside and you're, you're simply informed, this is the technology we're using. 
don't worry about the why, just start using it. In terms of all the different things that you installed and configured, is there anything that really stood out or surprised you or things that you would like our listeners to know? I think starting with the flux CDs thing is definitely a, a good uh, a good move. Uh, just because it, it like the writing, it forces you to kind of document your progress. You can't just like kubectl apply something. Uh, you you force keep track of what you're actually doing with the cluster. I think that's a super helpful tool. Having done this, would you recommend this as 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 a good experience for our audience to build a bare metal cluster? I mean, if uh, if cost is a big issue. Uh, like if you're a, an enterprise customer and you're worried about keeping costs down, I think yes. I think also if it's a learning experience, uh, I think yes. Um, there are still, I mean, Kubernetes has improved a lot, but there are still some foot guns out there. So managed solutions are great if you just want to, you know, hit the ground running and you have a product to build. Um, but uh, but there, there are still some, uh, some, some, some edges you can cut yourself on and stuff like that. Uh, but it's really fun. And in terms of you know companies that based on the sector that they're in have no choice but to to deploy clusters on prem, any recommendations you would give them? I mean, make sure that you have the people and the education to 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 manage it because it's it's a little bit different to manage you know on prem architecture uh, versus cloud architecture. A lot of the hard things like networking and storage is handled for you and managed the solutions. Um, so there's like a, a whole new world of bugs and strange issues you can run into. Um, so, I mean, it, I don't want to like hard sell it too hard. Uh, Kubernetes can be difficult, but it doesn't have to be super difficult. Uh, most people can do it, but it also takes time. And I think you need to devote the proper attention and time to, to, to know what you're actually doing uh, if you do it this way. I think that touches a very important point that you mentioned, you know, the people factor in an organization, building a culture where folks are out there trying different things, getting their own experience doesn't mean it has to be an obligation to do so. But have you seen any cultural aspects in different organizations that might be more, let's say, lending to a to certain practices of of people making sure that they're going out and you know doing their own sort of proofs of concepts, things of that nature? I mean, I think it's super important that, you know, developers have the time to to also experiment with uh, some of the potential huge benefits they might see in, in future technology. Uh, I think it's also one of those things that people overlook a lot in organizations, that you don't have enough slack because you're running a, a sprint and you need to fill it like 90 to 100% with, with time. So, I mean, developer downtime, I think, is, uh, is something that people should focus a lot more on because at least, well, most of the developers and operations people I've met are have like a natural curiosity. Uh, so if they get, you know, 20% of their time where they're just like sitting there twiddling their thumbs, they're probably going to go on Reddit or Hacker News or uh, some other uh, technology forum and start looking at what other people are doing and seeing if everything is applicable to their own situation. Great point. And then those experiences can then make in decisions better informed because someone actually has real life experience working with one of these technologies. You said that you spent a, you know a hundred hours in this process and then many many more in in terms of writing the blog um the blog series what's been the what's the feedback been like what have people commented on have there been any surprises there for you i mean i was surprised to get any feedback at all to be honest uh i posted on reddit and got some pretty good feedback there and then my girlfriend egged me on to post it on hack news and i went along with that uh, good job and, and shout out just, to her <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, just, uh, I, I kind of expect to just get, you know, just drown in the deluge of, of content that's posted there. So I was actually really surprised to get any feedback at all, and especially such positive feedback. I mean, um, who cares about my tiny little three-node cluster in, in Germany? Uh, but apparently a lot of people do and found it really interesting. Yeah. I think it's I think it's something, you know, that for everyone, make, you know, community part of your experience and part of your strategy. And by putting those ideas out there, people will interact. You know, sometimes you may get responses that might be, there could just be a misunderstanding or that they might be really, really passionate about one technology over another. But respecting yeah. the effort that goes behind it, I think is is essential. Yeah. And having done this, what's next for you? Are you going to be building more on-prem clusters? What can we expect from Matthias? Um, I'm hoping to build some more clusters. Uh, I also have a few more 
blog ideas up in the in the pipeline uh some uh, monitoring and stuff like that um yeah i'm hoping to to make kubernetes uh cluster building my what even like my my core work um uh but uh it's, it's it hasn't really uh what do you call it cemented yet but it's it's a work in progress yeah and when you're not building you know on-prem clusters in your spare time what do you like to do for fun um well, that's what I do for fun. <laughs> uh, I uh, I became a dad in April. Uh, Congratulations! So thank you. So some downtime with the paternity leave is also what allowed me to actually go through with this project. Uh, so that explains a lot of it. Um, so a six month old daughter, and we're moving here in in a month. So uh, you've got nothing but free time. <laughs> I've got no free time. It's just paperwork and diapers. So uh, yeah, that's what I'm uh, what I'm having fun with in my spare time. I think it's great though, is that yeah, being able to 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 blend something that's both professionally beneficial and also in you know that's personally rewarding and going out and uh, testing out these things, getting that experience, sharing with others to help them grow. I I really thank you for for your work, and I'm, I'm sure many other people have done the same. If people want to get in touch with you to ask you more directly about what you've done, what's the best way to do it? Uh, either by email or through LinkedIn. I think uh, both of them are on my website. <laughs> so pretty easy to find. We'll be linking uh, your website as well in the show notes so people will be able to reach out if they want to. Matias, thank you very much for joining us today. Really appreciate your work and hope to see you in the future. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.